much, uh, Jess. And uh, Jess is not only a colleague and a comrade, she is also a cherished friend. And when you call yourself a movement mom, my, my heart just uh, uh, got a little warm and fuzzy. At Cooperation Humboldt, y'all, we always say children are always welcome at Cooperation Humboldt meetings and events. That was pre-COVID. Uh, so I, but, but, but during COVID, I've had a chance to see uh, Jessica be a movement mom and actually do some mothering of her child while she's facilitating uh, meetings. So just had to honor that and bring that uh, uh, into the space. And I have the privilege and honor of working with Mike Strode. Uh, Mike, I got to, I, I first met Mike through the work that he does with the Koala Nut Collaborative in Chicago. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I, he was brought to me by Melicia Figueroa, Mel, who I also hold in very high regard. And Mike, I think I may have told you this, but Mel said, yo, David, you got to meet this guy. Like, we, like you got, like, y'all are going to get along. And uh, so I met him a couple of years ago at an event that we did in Chicago and was so impressed and inspired uh, by the work that he's doing uh, that uh, I and others invited him to join us on the board of directors at the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, where he is doing uh, just a... Uh, uh, amazing work at helping to actually build the movement of movements, right? So what I'm going to do, y'all, I want to be really transparent. We're going to talk about the Resist and Build Framework and the Solidarity Economy Network uh, and, and what that framework means and really invite you into a, uh, a, a conference that the three of us are all actively involved with uh, that starts next week. That's right, on Earth Day. And the conference is titled post-capitalism building the solidarity economy. We'll be talking about concrete things that are actually happening right now to shift the transition and not just environmental transition as important as that is, but socio-political economic transition like public banking, participatory budgeting, community land trust, work our own cooperatives. We'll go into all of that, but I'm really excited uh, to say that I'm going to invite you all to join that conference because both Mike and Jessica and myself are helping to co-organize it. So with that, I'm actually going to ask Mike to, 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 to talk a little bit about what the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network is, what the Solidarity Economy Framework is, and touch on the resist and build approach that we've been taking. So with that, I, I welcome Mike Strode into the conversation. All right, uh, thank you much, uh, David. Thank you, Jess. I'm glad to be on the panel with you all. Um, yes, and, and my, my name is Mike Strode, uh, as, as David mentioned, of the Colonet Collaborative. Uh, I reside in uh, historically stewarded lands of the Anishinaabe, um, Council of Three Fires, Odi, o, Ojibwe, Odawa, Potawatomi, and uh, many other tribes and nations um, here, uh, presently known as Chicago. And specifically, if you know the geography, I'm in Southeast Chicago. Uh, which is uh, presently home to a great environmental justice um, battle, um, a battleground. Uh, there is a, we've got the Calumet River, we've got the, the borders of Lake Michigan, um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, and this is steel country, right? You know, we are in the heart of steel country. Um, and uh, here we, we've got like historical, you know, uh, intersections of these battles, of these, of these challenges coming at, uh, we're at the intersection here. So, um, we've had uh, coal ash, uh, we've had pet coke, um, we've had manganese, um, and presently we've got a, a salvage plant and, you know, and they're trying to re re redevelop a brownfield so that they can build some sort of underground structure underneath it because the brownfield can't be used otherwise. Why do I mention all of these things, right? I mean, this is sort of at the intersection of this notion of transition. Um, the, the, the beauty of transition, right? Um, the beauty and the travesty of transition is that there are communities who want to transition to these more beautiful structures, but have been forced into the narrative that they have always needed to resist against what is foisted upon them. Um, because the beauty, the beauty of downtown, the other side of the beauty of downtown is uh, the ugliness that we have to hold in Southeast Chicago. Um, and so that's, you know, the importance of the solidarity economy framework um, that I like to gravitate and orient in. 
Um, so, so what is the solidarity economy? Um, this notion of this more equitable, this more just, this, uh, this, this differently valued economy. Um, and what is it countering against? Um, I want to, to ground in, um, in first the sort of, you know, um, the, the what is capitalism characteristics that, you know, um, that, that we often use in, in the context of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network um, and the characteristics, right? Um, because it's important to, to uh, ground in the fact that capitalism is not just an ism that exists. It is not the economy. It is a type of economy. Um, and and it, is, it is one that, you know, um, we are characteristically trying to do something different with the solidarity economy. So it's important to sort of position the counter talk about what is what what is beyond that um, and what we are trying to get to. Uh, so what is capitalism, right? Private ownership of the means of production, wage labor, profit maximization, commodity production, market exchange, you know, five fundamental characteristics of capitalism. Um, and, and what is the solidarity economy in, as a counter to that? Um, so the solidarity economy, you know, really grounds in uh, a set of values that, um, you know, we we often name uh, we often name five. I like to name seven because oftentimes they collapse like solidarity, cooperation, and mutualism all into one thing. But for me, they are fundamentally uh, different types of things. They're different different approaches to the same outcome. Um, ultimately, you know, to be in solidarity, you know, um, I I recall the um, uh, Jeff Perry quoting uh, you know quoting Bruce Dixon talked about. Um, Solidarity being the outcome of common struggle, right? Um, recognizing that, you know, although we might be wearing different shoes, you know, we are, we are sort of situated on the same ground. Um, and to be in solidarity is to, to recognize that and to operate from that space, uh, to, to recognize that my struggle is, is bound up and tied up with your struggles. Um, and so, so that, though, that's important. So there's solidarity, there's cooperation, uh, just this this notion that you know if we can we can build some things collectively together we can we can see ourselves having a common beneficial outcome we can work together to achieve that beneficial outcome mutualism uh, participatory democracy uh, is another aspect of it right you know wrestling with this notion of, of of what it means to have a democracy not just in name but one that actually is the practice and the participation uh, participatory democracy equity sustainability and pluralism. Um, and I'm, I, I know I'm leaping over those large three, like, you know, equity is a really important conversation. Um, it's in the way that it's, it's discussed nowadays, can be very limited. Um, sustainability, not simply of the environment, but, of, but also of, of other areas of cultural sustainability, of all of these aspects of sustainability that, that, that are critical, right? So the rights of Mother Earth are important. Um, the rights of, of people's cultural relationship to Mother Earth is important. Uh, so, so those are things that sustainability speaks to. And then pluralism, just this notion that, um, again, uh, capitalism focuses on, because it's focused on profit maximization, it's focused on one direction, and it's focused on, um, it, and it's focused on narrowing opportunities, right? You know, so that, so it, it, it pretends through market exchange to, to give us a vast, you know, array of choices, but all of those choices have been decided before they get to you, <laughs> you know, before you get to the point of consumption, all the choices have already been made. And in pluralism, we recognize that we need to open up the vast array of choices so people have to know um, how they want things to produce, what relationship they want with her, and how that changes the things that they choose to consume. Uh, so so that's, that's the sort of, those are the values that are wrapped up in the solidarity economy. And those are the things that the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network seeks to represent and seeks to uh, foment as part of this, this global movement, right? Um, because not just about what the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network does in the U.S., but we have international um, spaces. We have international organizations that are working on these, these things like Repes. Um, and we have regional organizations, you know, that are working on solidarity economy in Brazil. We have reg the regional social economy workshop in, uh, in, in um, Quebec, you know, in, in Canada. And so there are organizations that are in other spaces wrestling with these values and trying to build them inside of the, the, their communities uh, through institutions and entities such as cooperatives, such as time banks, such as credit unions, um, this, this vast array of, of, of things that 
that, that seek to do one primary thing. How do we shift decision making about the, the ways that we engage with the economy and the ways that decisions are made within the economy back down to the lowest common denominator? And, and, and to kind of relocalize that conversation, right? Because I, I, love, I love staying local. I love being, you know, I, I, you know, oftentimes when I'm in spaces, I'm like, I can't grasp the national conversation. What I can do is what I'm doing in my community. So if we relocalize it, if we get down to the conversation of, of who gets to decide what to do with the brownfield in Southeast Chicago along the lakefront, who gets to decide whether or not the salvage plant relocates from Lincoln Yards, a historically white community, to Southeast Chicago, historically black and, and, and Mexican community? Um, who gets to make that decision? And how is the community involved in that decision? The solidarity economy says that the community is at the table for every aspect of that decision, for every aspect of planning. What is the develop? What are the developments that we want? What are most beneficial to 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 the outcomes that we see for ourselves? Um, and and what is it that you know? Um, how how would we like this to look in the end? Um, so so all of that stated, that that's what the sort of U.S. Solidarity Economy Network works on. That's what the solidarity economy situates itself at as and is. And in my role in that, you know, in, in the local context of Chicago is to try to build a time bank. <laughs> so, or try to build and try to sustain a time bank. And if I can do that one thing and I can do that one thing well, then hopefully I will have fulfilled my solidarity economy mission. Jeff? Fantastic, Mike, thank you so very much. And uh, Rola, I thank you for your question. Uh, we are going to be making a recording available. Uh, there'll be links within that recording. Uh, and uh, I will, um, uh, I've already done it in the, in the chat, but I'll make a pledge that I'll, I'll get in, into uh, Jessica's hands, you know, uh, some of this stuff, right? But I thought that what Mike did was actually brilliant to really break down what is capitalism? Because, uh, you know, I, I have often had the impression uh, or experience uh, where folks say, oh, capitalism is too com complicated, it's too hard. Like, and I sort of chuckle about that, y'all, because uh, it's just an economic system, as Mike said. It's not given to us by on high. It's not inevitable. Uh, any more than white supremacy is inevitable, by the way, right? These are constructs, uh, and anything that's constructed can be deconstructed and reconstructed differently, right? One thing that I like to remind folks is, uh, oh, quick pop quiz uh, in the chat or Jessica and Mike, from what language does the word economy derive? And for bonus points on the pop quiz, what did it actually mean in that original language? Greek, management of the home, Greek, house, Brian, sorry, Jess, yay, team. That's right, y'all economy just means management of the household, right? And here's the thing, transitioners, because I'm a transitioner too. You know, I'm on the Collaborative Design Council of Transition US. I'm proud of that. I'm proud that Cooperation on Multi is a transition of local initiative. And what we know is our house or our household is Mother Earth. I'm going to say that again. I know, uh, you know, Mike said, localize, localize. And we can do both of these. I can acknowledge that the home is Mother Earth and my particular neighborhood is Jarajiji, right? Also known as Eureka, right? Here's the thing. The economy understood properly is managing our household, managing Mother Earth's, not just resources, but all of Mother Earth. And can we as transitioners agree that frankly, in industrialism and white supremacy and settler colonialism, we've done a shitty job. I mean, it's really terrible. And, and so the economic system known as capitalism is not the only problem, but it is absolutely part of the problem because as Mike laid out those definitions, uh, I'll just point out y'all, those definitions, you can crack any introduction to macroeconomics textbook at a high school or college level, and that'll basically be the definition, right? Private ownership of the means of production, 
goods and services are produced as commodities, uh, that those commodities are bought and saved for at a profit, profit maximization. Uh, labor itself is just another commodity that's bought and paid for. And lastly, the market allocates it. And in fact, not only will that be the definition, in those textbooks, they say it's a good thing and they'll laud all of the wonderful liberty and how productive they are and so forth. And what I'll say is, and if you take one step back from those definitions and think about the implications of all of those, what you have is a, a dictate, a demand to consume at all costs. And with industrialism, we are experiencing that we are consuming Mother Earth faster than she can replenish herself. This profit maximization and infinite growth on a finite planet, y'all, can we be honest? That's the ideology of the cancer cell. Like that is literally going to destroy the planet if we don't stop. So Jess, I want to bring you into this conversation and ask like your reaction, reflection, and, and an honest invitation to you or anybody else in this conversation using the chat. Am I going too far? Am I being fair to what capitalism is? Because I think as transitioners, we should actually grapple with that. Is it possible to actually address the, the, the looming uh, global climate crisis that's not just coming, it's here and getting worse, the, the peak oil? Like, is it possible to transition and still accept those characteristics of capitalism? I would offer the metaphor uh, of a garden where a lot of folks in transition are very inspired by permaculture. And we understand that having biodiversity, having species that work together collaboratively to perform different roles creates a healthier garden. So same thing with capitalism, it's a foreclosure of worlds. I really love this way of thinking about it in that it limits possibilities and it says this is the only right way to do business. And you also mentioned kind of those high school economics textbooks and I remember the focus on competition and the fact that there are winners and losers. I also like to think about these things, like how would I explain this to my son? Um, we, we were just in downtown Los Angeles. And so what I'm seeing is capitalism at work, allocating scarce resources. And what we're seeing is that folks are being discarded, literally thrown away by this system. So I don't think you went too far. I think it was quite fair. I'm actually reading something that would be really enticing to, I think, a lot of transition folks and folks who are outside the movement. It's called The Bioregional Economy, Land, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness by Molly Scott Cato. And she does an amazing job of unpacking the narratives and the mythologies that are implicitly at work when we talk about things like capitalism and the economy. So this, again, this myth that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet, it's insane. It's like, I think we can even go there and say, this is insane and it is killing the earth. And I'm happy to, to say it that way because I have a child, I have a literal stake in the future and I think we need to call it out for what it is. So, yeah. Thank you. And that's right, folks. Uh, just calling David Cobb out for not going hard enough. Uh, on capitalism. Mike, I wanna, since you were the one who started with the, with the sort of framing to get you to react to anything that you heard from Jessica or myself. Yeah, um, so I'll, 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 I'll ground first in permaculture. Um, so the, the Coldenet Collaborative, um, and, and you know, I didn't explain this fully you know, earlier, but um, the, the project that really got me started on the solidarity economy was the Coldenet Collaborative which is a, a time bank, you know, a sh Chicago's only time-based service and skills exchange. Um, for, for those who are familiar with time banking, it's just trading time as a currency, uh, folks being able to put their gifts, their skills, their capacities onto a platform, um, exchange those with other members on the time bank and be able to bank their time so that they can spend it on some service that they need in the future. Um, so, I got started out in developing the time bank as a part of a permaculture course with the uh, Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living. Um, Fred, Baba Fred Carter and Dr. Jafunza Wright Carter. Um, and the important thing about the, that project and how it relates to transition uh, really keenly is that um, the Carters started Black Oak Center because they saw 
a gap, right? You know, and this this is the important part around the solidarity economy and around around cooperatives, right? Cooperatives show up where markets leave gaps, right? Um, the market is always leaving a gap. Um, I have a, a a block on a on a on seventy first and Jeffrey here in Chicago, which was without a grocery store for seven years because you know the Albertsons, you know, um, or not Albertsons, Dominics, you know left the market. They just left the entire Midwest and they were like, oh, we're gonna, not gonna drop a store here. And no one else wanted to come to that neighborhood. So Mark, you know, the market economy, capitalism always leaves these gaps. And so the Carters um, saw a tremendous gap in the level of community resilience and, and, and climate adaptation education that was being engaged with black communities, right? Um, the, the, I mean, you know, basically, uh, the, the honest assessment of it, you know what I mean? This is, this is an important critique. The ecological movement had left, uh, left our community behind. So they were like, look, you know, we're gonna develop the Black Oak Center for Sustainable Renewable Living, and we're gonna teach Black communities the skills that we think that they will need for an, an energy descent future. Now, this was in 2005. So um, fast forward to, you know, 2010, I meet them. I work with them developing this Healthy Food Hub initiative, which was, you know, connecting a uh, historically Black farming community of Pembroke to, uh, food insecure communities on the south and west sides of Chicago. And, you know, um, we, we begin building out that healthy food hub initiative. So basically the farmers don't have a route to market, right? Because, you know, the only option that they have is to drive their food up here, come to a farmer's market, hope they sell something, and, you know, usually go home with more, you know, a bunch of produce that they can't use or need to sell at a loss. Um, so, you know, so again, always trying to solve these problems, always using a community self-determination mechanism or method to solve, to, to seek a solution to a problem, not a, not a solution that says we need to go out and get you know, a large provider or a large supplier and they need to come in and they need to help us build a market, but how can we use our community self-determination and our community pipelines to build these structures and build these solutions? Um, and out of, out of that work with the Healthy Food Hub came the Colonet Collaborative Time Bank because I was facilitating their social permaculture uh, lessons, you know, within their, their permaculture course. And the Carters, you know, um, I, I call them sort of prophetic or prescient, you know, in this, um, recognize that, hey, you know, the gap in permaculture oftentimes, and Starhawk talks about this too in, in some, of, some of her work, right, is that, you know, we teach people how to do these fantastic land design projects, land design initiatives. But the moment that they attempt to do those in concert with other people, things break apart, right? We don't, we don't know how to facilitate in, in the, the sort of social relationships that are at the key, the, the center of that. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm relating sort of this Colonet collaborative development back to permaculture because, um, you know, one of the things that I, I see as the really important part of the solidarity economy and, and it's even talked about in the um, Post Carbon Institute's um, Six Foundations of Community Resilience report, right? Um, they talk about the, the key to ensuring that community resilience actually can happen is people, right? We have to figure out how to facilitate and engage with people and, and ensure that, that we are honoring the voice of people um, so that it's not just us bringing solutions to people, but it's always about how we engage the conversation so that people can design solutions for themselves and their communities. Solidarity economy is about participatory democracies. So I'll pause there. Thank you so much. Uh, and Jess, I know you have a question from Rolla, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, but, but I'm also gonna let you know, Charlene, that uh, we don't really quite understand the how transform bottom dash values of capitalism. So if you could flesh that out a little bit, we'd love to grapple with it, but but we're not exactly sure what you're asking. So Jess. Yes. So this question from Rolla, Rolla how does the solidarity economy differ or align with eco-anarchism, social ecology, democratic socialism, et cetera? It's a great question. It is, Mike. Uh, do you want to take that, or do you want me to like? Because there's there, like that's a di like it's a provocative and profound and astute question. You're likely to get several different answers. So, Mike, uh, I'm going to invite you to go first if you like, and Jess, I'd love to get your voice into the mix, and then uh, I also would like to be able to respond. Yes, and so I'll, I'll take the the approach and the lens that I generally take um, with with isms and philosophies. Um, I, 
I didn't have a political philosophy for, and I, I still don't have a, what I call a clear political philosophy. I don't, don't, don't walk along any clear political lines, um, but there's a lot of anarchism in me, right? Um, but it's not the anarchism that many, many who call themselves anarchists might subscribe to. Um, and, and, you know, and, and this, there, there's been a, a, a bit of writing re recently, you know, um, and, and hopefully this is not too deep in the, in the mud here. But there's been a bit of write, writing recently about the sort of black anarchisms, right? You know, black cultural anarchisms, black communal anarchisms, um, which is just that, you know, the anarchism that exists in black communities is quite different because in the context of black people in America, um, we have often existed outside of law anyway. Right? We have all often existed either, we've had to be in, in, in contradiction to the laws of this land, right? Um, and so, you know, again, that, that's, that's a little bit too, too in depth, but what I'm saying, what I'm getting at there is that um, I don't situate the solidarity economy necessarily in trying to, I, I don't try to kind of fit it in those isms or, or try to, you know, make comparisons against it. Um, what, I rec what I recognize that it's trying to do is allow communities to find some of their own answers but using these sort of recognizing these common values amongst the answers that they're locating. Um, so, you know, you can have a democratic socialist communal planning process, um, but you can also have one that's tyrannical in nature and not participatory at all. And, you know, and I, I, am, I am part of, you know, a few political left formations that have become tyrannical in nature um, <laughs> over time. So, you know, um, the ism is less important than the values and it's important that we try to situate ourselves within the values um, before we, you know, try to name, hey, this is eco-anarchism, this is social ecology, and this is democratic socialism, because I've seen them all fall apart um, at different times. Check. Jess, would you like to uh, take, take a crack at that one? Yeah, like I... I, I relate and resonate with a lot of what Mike just shared. And I feel like the solidarity economy, as I understand it and have experienced it, creates space, again, values those diverse perspectives, but are aligned around a similar set of, of um, yeah, a similar set of values about what is important, what needs to be perpetuated and what needs to stop. So I think there's space for everybody. And I also tend to not subscribe to certain isms and don't define myself clearly. Um, aside from the fact that I feel like collective liberation is where I'm at. I need to struggle for your freedom and liberation just as much as my own. So that's kind of my answer. And you shared a resource from Emily Kwana, which I will definitely check out. And what I'm doing now, folks, is literally sharing uh, the screen. So those of you who are watching visually can take a look at Emily. And Emily is the, uh, is the co-coordinator of the US Solidarity Economy Network. Uh, Mike and I are both on the board of directors with her. Uh, you've literally, Rala, given us a chance to, to bring Emily into this conversation. I won't do nearly as good a job as she does, but this is her effort, really a primer on some of these isms, as Mike uh, said. But, you know, I often say, you know, some people say, oh, I am not into labels, man. And to which I respond, words are labels that we use to communicate. The problem is some people end up in using labels to actually shut down communication rather than to facilitate conversation. And what I thought Mike did was a very deft uh, and astute and not a, not a sleight of hand, but, but a really like, look, like, can we actually talk about the thing rather than using ways to, to, to categorize things rather than grapple with them, right? So that's how I heard Mike's answer. Uh, and what I'm going to do with Emily's piece is really, and if you take a look, so this is a basic primer to the solidarity economy. Mike has already given you the characteristics, right? Uh, cooperation, equity across all dimensions, participatory democracy, sustainability, and pluralism, that there are many paths to achieve this. I want to repeat, the solidarity economy is not dogmatic. It is not rigid. Uh, there are core principles and values, but it can look like a lot of different ways. Uh, and what Emily has done and Julie Matai, another board member who wrote this piece, the post-capitalist and capitalist, and she situates on the bottom, there can be a post-capitalist totally authoritative.
libertarian state socialism, right? Uh, there and there, then you can have other solidarity economy frameworks. Uh, I would argue social ecology, the, uh, social ecology, democratic socialism, uh, are within that other solidarity economy framework. Please note that democratic forms of socialism can be post-capitalist, truly post-capitalist. But check this out: in the capitalist framework, you could literally have social democracy. The reality is what is experienced in Sweden and Norway and the, the Scandinavian countries that are often lifted up, that version of democratic socialism uh, is in fact social democracy. It is existing within the capitalist framework. Is it better than neoliberalism? Is it better than authoritarian state socialism? You bet it is, right? But it is still capitalist. New Deal capitalism is actually uh, like not even as democratic as social democracy, right? Like you basically seed almost all of the means of production, all of the decisions. But what you say is we're going to have a stronger safety net under New Deal uh, capitalism. Finally, there's neoliberalism, which is basically, and uh, I'm quoting uh, Emily, uh, markets good, right? That that's literally like you know that that is neoliberalism, like. Uh, markets uber alice. It is literally privatize all the things, the rising tide lift all boats, et cetera, et cetera. So Rola, what I've just tried to do, and by the way, you can see she then goes down and talks about what do we mean by capitalism, uh, the different types of capitalism. I mean, this piece by Emily and Julie are really profound and, and I think really sort of answer that question. So I've stopped sharing. I did drop it into the, in, into the link. Are the, the link into the notes for folks who want to see it. And again, I'll take the responsibility of capturing some of this into a, a report back because I really think that transitioners need to grapple with this. Like, I, I honestly, like, I'm just being completely candid. I don't think that transition can succeed in the beautiful vision that I hear from transitioners without coming to terms that capitalism as the socio-political economic way of organizing society, it won't let you, right? It will let you have a little niche thing in the, oh, oh, by the way, if you own the land, right, Mike? Like, <laughs> you're right. Like, it's really hard to get your hands on land these days uh, and certainly enough land to even do permaculture. But even if you do only the little bit of land that you do, don't even imagine that you get to actually transform the system. So Rola, that was my effort to, to answer that incredibly good question and profound question. And now Charlene did actually uh, write in to say what the question was, the bottom line values of capitalism are making money and growth. How, in other words, do we get beyond band-aids? And I gotta say, she's literally asking the question, Mike, that I have tasked you and other organizers have tasked you of answering at the post-capitalism conference, because get this, we're bringing together Mike Strode of the US Solidarity Economy Network and Trinity Tran of the uh, Public Banking Alliance and Rick Wolf, arguably the most famous uh, uh, modern uh, uh, economist grappling with solidarity economy today. The three of them are gonna be at the post-capitalism conference. Uh, I'll drop that into the chat again. You got to register and go. So, Mike, I'm going to ask this question directly to you. How do we get beyond Band-Aids and get to this? How do we get there? Um, the, the question of the Band-Aid is, is um, always an interesting one for me um, because we, you know, there, there's, there's the temptation oftentimes um, in, in spaces where, we're, try, where we're, we're trying to foster and seek after social change, social transformation, to think that the solution that we are doing is too small. Um, and, and, and it is possible that we can be thinking too small, um, but it is just as possible that if we uh, focus on, if we try to locate our activity in too broad a sphere, um, that we end up just kind of, we, we basically end up burning ourselves out, spreading ourselves too thin and not having um, much of the impact that we wanna have. So um, I would say that we need many, many more Band-Aids and we need all of those Band-Aids to federate. 
Um, and 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 I, I would say that from the, the perspective that um, the the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives is um, some four or five years old, you know, 10, maybe, I don't know, you know, just it's, it's new. It's new on the world of the solidarity economy stage. There are many more advanced social, social and solidarity economy spheres internationally than there are in the U.S., but yet I happen to be watching a panel with Esteban Kelly, you know, talking about the U.S. Federation history and work, and the, there were folks internationally asking the U.S. how they got so good at this, right? Now, you know, I mean that you know don't want to kind of lean into hubris, right? Not U.S. centric at all, right? Um, but just just leaning into the notion that it is possible that when we focus on a thing and we get really good at a thing and we get and we start to think about how we federate our efforts together, as the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives did, then we can expand our impact um, in in ways that we could not imagine. And I think that you know uh, similarly. You know, um, in this moment that we are in um, post, post Floyd rebellion and an, up, an uprising, um, where we have people who have been talking about abolition for decades. And in this moment, when we have, a, have an opening, and this is something that we talk about um, in I think our, maybe our Solidarity Economy 101, or no, maybe we talked, I talked about that in a different event. But when we have these sort of openings that, that show up, then it is possible that those who are working on solutions at a small and a micro level have the possibility to rapidly expand and multiply their solution across many more spaces. So a lot of the folks who are working on abolition on a very small level were really doing you know, conflict resolution and mediation amongst their individual organizations and amongst individual organizers. But when there came a moment where people realized the sheer brutality of, of, of the, this, this so-called sort of police you know, uh, state, um, there was the possibility to really multiply their conflict resolution solutions, their mediation, mediation plans, their community safety plans across a number of other spaces, right? So we need to work and perfect the band-aids where we are, and then we need to look for those, those transformative openings, those transformative moments, and move quickly to move to push the solution to to more places in those moments, um, but if if we're if we're just waiting for the sh the big transformative moment or the big transformative impact, and we're not actually perfecting how the band aid looks, how the band aid feels, um, then then we we will have we we basically get to a moment like COVID nineteen, and the only people who have solutions at the ready are capitalists. So get your solutions ready, make them do them well. Organize them in community, you know, organize them in concert with the communities that are, are most impacted. So here in Southeast Chicago, if you're not on the environmental justice front lines in Southeast Chicago, you probably need to be. You can't be doing transition in Chicago and not have a have a, an opinion about you know what's happening here. Um, but you know, get those solutions ready because when there comes a moment like a brownfield redevelopment. We don't just want to have, you know, um, Amazon data centers as the solution that is being proposed, which is the solution that's being proposed. <laughs> How about that? Cap capitalism has a solution to all the problems, and it's 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 kinder it's kinder more gentle capitalism. So, Jess, I'm going to ask the same question of you. The bottom line values of capitalism are making money and growth. How, in other words, do we get beyond band aids? Yes to everything that Mike just said, but where my mind went was GDP as this measure of the health and vitality of an economy and how completely divorced it is from the reality that there are people that make up this economy. And so I'm thinking of countries that have put forward work around measuring happiness, how we're not able to provide for basic needs in this country for our entire population, the wealthiest, most powerful nation on the earth. So I, I think about how do we attack kind of the heart of the philosophy that guides the system. And the fact that we have this kind of mandate or this prayer within an economy that man will pursue their own rational self-interest. Well, if I were to take that to a logical conclusion, like in my rational self-interest, I would like for the planet to be alive, to be able to sustain a future. So I'm thinking about those kinds of conversations um, and I'll stop there, but that's where my mind went. So uh, I, I, I'm going to borrow that uh, technique. So yes to everything Mike said, yes to everything Jess said, 
And Charlene, you asked a great question because what, what provoked for me was, oh, actually uh, the way I look at it, like if it's truly just a Band-Aid, I'm not interested, right? Like we're not gonna recycle our way into transition, right? Like, so, so uh, and if somebody is really like, you know, uh, suffering from cancer, putting a Band-Aid on them is just complete utter nonsense and foolishness, right? So, uh, and what the way, but the way I think about it is uh, like, so I know I alone simply do not have the agency to actually restructure society according to the solidarity economy framework. I alone don't have the agency to deconstruct capitalism or for that matter, white supremacy or heteropatriarchy or settler colonialism. What I do have the capacity to do is in my own community here in Jarajiji, also known as Eureka, where I live, work, play and pray, how can I help myself and my community meet our needs collectively in, the in a re genuinely regenerative way and in the interest of collective liberation. And what that ends up looking like is planting fruit trees in publicly accessible places, building little free pantries so that food is shared, including with houseless people who are, by the way, our neighbors too, right? Like we, we really need to uh, anchor that. It also looks like building uh, community gardens and mini gardens, but it also ends up looking like uh, uh, supporting public banking at the local and regional level and even the state level. It ends up looking like building participatory budgeting processes. It ends up looking like, and here's the sexy one, y'all, creating an indigenous community land trust between Cooperation Humboldt and the Wiat people who have stewarded this land since time immemorial to make a commitment to one another that we are going to raise money, both philanthropic and investment money, and will only engage in projects that have two core characteristics. Number one, that we believe engages in truly regenerative economic development. And number two, and this is important, has the formal approval of the Wiat Tribal Council. We are returning the power to the Wiat people to steward this land the way they are supposed to, the way they always have, the way that they did since, as I have been taught to say by Ted Hernandez and Michelle Vassell, uh, Wiat tribal leaders who are now my friends as well as my uh, neighbors since time immemorial. See, just like you, I want to live and I want to live differently. And here's the thing, y'all, like I can't leave my home. This is where I like, like, I, but I, like my ancestral homeland is Scotland and Ireland, where by the way, my ancestors were traumatized and brutalized by the English empire, driven off of that land. And then they came to this land and traumatized and brutalized the original inhabitants, right? So there's just trauma upon trauma upon trauma. By the way, it all has to do with the enclosure movement that Jess mentioned earlier, right? Like, I got news for you, empire sucks, right? Whether it's the English empire, and I got news for you, I bet that those indigenous people in and around the Aztec, the Mayan and the Incan empire, I bet they thought those empires sucked too, right? Africa had empires. It's not like white people are not genetically defective. It's not like somehow we're just like profoundly like damaged, right? empire and enclosure and power over and domination that's the problem right so what i'm getting at is if we can find our way to true collective liberation then guess what i get to not only live in jared gg but i got i get to live here authentically and in right relationship with the weot people under their tutelage as a guest and I get to be a good guest. My mama taught me that, right? I sometimes joke, she, she used to say, son, always be a good guest so you get invited back. That's why if I'm ever at your home, you'll see me helping to wash the dishes. If I stay overnight, I make the bed because I want to be invited back. I want to be a good guest. I want my mama to be proud of me. And I want my mama not to whip my ass if she finds out that I wasn't a good guest, to tell you the truth. Right, like so, like this mama's boy will be really like upfront and and honest. Like that's that's part of that loving discipline that a good mama will give you, right? 
Uh, so all I'm saying, y'all, is this notion of Band-Aids, if they're truly Band-Aids, call it out. Call it for what it is. Like, like it's just a Band-Aid. But if it is, like any of the things that I just described, y'all, alone, a community garden can't solve capitalism. But connected to a larger movement that's actually talking about restructuring society, that's the ticket. And that's why I say we have to resist and build. And I got to say, Mike, uh, Mike just dropped into the into the chat. Uh, I, I mentioned Mel Figueroa earlier, so he gives a shout out to the work that uh, uh, Ali Matters Night. Uh, our like, so you must know Ali too. So Ali is also a dear friend of mine as well. And Mike's, they're doing. You, well, you talk about uh, Tek and what they're doing, Mike, so that I don't I don't just take your good information and take the credit. Hit it. Well, you know, definitely. I mean, there's no credit to take because, you know, all credit is due to um, these organizers, but also the the traditional indigenous uh, knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge that they are engaging in the communities that they are that they are rooted in and that they are part of, um, you know, to, to, to David's analysis there. Um, the these communities that we, you know, it's important that like when you're doing the land acknowledgement, it's not performative. It's not a performative ritual. It's an acknowledgement that like this traditional ecological, ecological knowledge, this traditional stewardship practice um, is a way that, um, that, that land has been held for a very long time, a lot of history, right? Um, you know, I mean, if, 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 in, if industrial America is, you know, 100 years old and like, I mean, you know, various elements in colonial and industrial America are like 500 years old, right? I mean, we have, you know, societies and civilizations that are going back far beyond that, that knew how to hold land and didn't burn it up in a hundred years, which is what we did, right? You know, I mean, well, you know, well, which is, which is what this land did, you know, I mean, I'm very careful about my we, um, but, you know, um, so just recognizing that um, traditional ecological knowledge um, has hyper-local bioregional solutions um, for land stewardship and that it cannot be that you know, we think that we are bringing knowledge to communities. Um, we are often, you know, just kind of excavating knowledge that communities already had and that communities already possess, um, which is an important aspect of decolonializing, right? You know, um, whether it's transition practice or permaculture practice, recognizing that communities already have knowledge, and that's a principle of popular education. We already have knowledge within us and within our community, within our hearts, within our our, our cultures. And so can we do the work together to excavate that knowledge and that history, um, you know, whatever it is, you know, and, and, and I, I certainly give credit to um, the writing and work of, of Dr. Jessica Gordon Imhard, whose uh, text Collective Courage really speaks to that in, from a, a culturally, uh, a, from Black people in America, Black, Black cultural history in America is a history, again, and, you know, of communities who have had to exist outside of economies and outside of law, and they have developed several of these cooperative practices that, you know, while they may have been a sort of nod to the Rochdale folks, they didn't necessarily know about them. And no one from Rochdale came to like teach them cooperation. They simply said, look, the only way that we are going to get it, the only way that we are going to survive is to figure out how we work together and how we build institutions together, how we organize and love on one another. And from that, we built life affirming and just institutions as, as discussed in the chat. So yes, um, I, give, I give credence there to the traditional ecological stewardship program um, in Chico. And then you know, also that, that nod to movement generation and their notion of permanently organized communities, because that is really about interconnected and intersecting solutions. So we're not just working on our urban, urban agriculture initiatives without thinking about how they connect to a more just food system um, on the consumption end, on the distribution and the logistical end, we need food sovereignty everywhere beyond just simply small gardens that that cater to you know just a, a local area. Check. Well said, Mike. And so just to, so I lifted up the the panel that Mike Strode is going to be doing again with Trinity Tran and uh, Professor Rick Wolf. You can tell I, I I hold Mike in high regard because I put that panel together and I said I'm gonna bring the heavy hitters to this one, right? So like y'all should come. Uh, we have a whole series. We're going to do public banking, participatory budgeting, worker co-ops, 
uh, and Jess, I'm going to invite you to talk a little bit about the session that you are doing as a transition leader. Uh, you and Ayako Nagano are going to be joining Oscar Mogollon uh, and Sabrina Miller of Cooperation Humboldt uh, on a session that is really exciting to me. And check out this name, Disaster Response through community resilience. So uh, Jessica, I'm gonna invite you to talk a little bit about like that session that's happening at the Post-Capitalism Conference uh, and why folks should come to that one. Yeah, I again, please check out all of these panels. I'm really excited for this session on the 25th. Um, we had an amazing prep discussion where we were talking about the deeper philosophical kind of approach that we're gonna have to disaster within this conversation. So I think it was kind of generally agreed upon. We're not gonna spend a huge amount of time telling you to you know, get a water bottle or get a go bag. We're gonna talk about how, and I think Matt, Mike has raised this earlier, the currency of relationships and understanding need and the landscape of opportunity within your communities is truly essential to be able to respond appropriately during times of disruption and disaster. We have to accept as well with the compounding crisis that we're dealing with, that these things are gonna become more frequent. And at the same time that we're responding to disasters, we're not trying to bounce back to normal. We're not trying to go back to the old world and the old system we had before. If anything, these opportunities can be a catalyst for strengthening our relationship and building these alternative, as mentioned before, life-affirming and just institutions. And Cooperation Humboldt has been doing some amazing work um, and so again, I'm, I'm just always giddy and inspired by Oscar and Sabrina and anytime I can share space with them. Um, and Ayako, our other panelist, who's a transitioner on our board for Transition US, has been doing some amazing work with the EPA talking about environmental justice and how this needs to be considered when we're talking about disaster preparedness as well. So it's going to be a great session. <sighs> I want to lift up, oh, I also want to lift up that uh, Rola had also asked in the chat, is there a working group or folks in Portland, Econo Portland, Oregon, connected to the Solidarity Economy Network? So uh, Jess, can you uh, put uh, Rola in touch with either transitioners and or other folks in the Solidarity Economy Network? And how about you, Mike? Do you know anybody that, or our group? Because I will just say, for example, there are folks called Symbiosis PDX, uh, that are doing some amazing work that, again, are pluralistically within the purview of the solidarity economy. Jess? So yes, I can do some digging and see if I can connect. Um, Rola, I have your email since you registered, so I'll do my best to find some connections for you. That's what I can offer right now. Mike, anything to add? Uh, no, I just put in the chat the the link to Symbiosis PDX. Um, you know that that would certainly be uh, one of my recommendations. Um, they are definitely you know doing doing work around solidarity economy around dual power and and you know and there's even been um, we we've had some some skill shares around time banking uh, because they were interested in the Colonel collaborative model. So um, yeah, I would give a nod to them. So I'm going to take this opportunity uh, to to call forth or uh, elicit any other comments or questions. They don't have to be uh, questions. They can absolutely be comments. Uh, I also want to invite folks who disagree with me, like, uh, like uh, or any uh, of us, right? Like, th this really is an open space. Uh, so uh, if you want to use either the, the, the chat function itself or the Q&A format that I know Jessica has access to, now is your time to do it, uh, because we're going to be wrapping up probably in about 15 minutes or so. But I also want to say again that there is no one right way to get to this solidarity economy framework. This notion of pluralism really does open up that space uh, for, uh, for lots of paths to the, to the mountain, right? But one thing that we are is explicitly post-capitalist. We don't end up, you know, like, like if somebody believes that capitalism can be reformed, I say, great, like, uh, like maybe you're right and I'm wrong. Like maybe capitalism can be reformed. I don't think it can because of its definition, but here's the thing, I've been wrong before. Maybe I'm wrong now. 
I'm not going to be turn you into my enemy. I'm going to find, well, where can we work together? Like I, I helped to write the law for uh, creation of local and regional public banks in California, right? It, that's, that's a huge victory. It's totally still within the capitalist framework. But here's what I want to say, y'all. For me, I see the solidarity economy uh, as a way to engage in non-reformist reforms, right? Now, for some people, they'll say, that doesn't make any sense, or that's inherently contradictory. But here's how I see it. A non-reformist reform, like the non-reformist is an adjective, right? It's still a reform. Like there's no way to just today wake up and say, I'm going to deconstruct white supremacy, capitalism, heteropatriarchy, and settler colonialism. And here's the campaign to do it, right? However, there is a way to work on concrete things that are in to, to harken back to uh, Charlene, not merely band-aids. The non-reformist reforms are their reforms, but they and they but by making people's lives better, concrete policies that begin to undermine the logic of capitalism. They undermine the power over dynamic. They begin to shift the whole thing. Non-reformist reforms include public banking participatory budgeting, worker-owned cooperatives, community land trust, local democratically controlled energy production and distribution models, universal basic income. Like you could probably add to that list, right? But those are the six that I talk about usually because every one of those actually have campaigns that are in place right now to create them in local communities and to expand them because here's the thing, every single one of those are actually happening somewhere in this, uh, in this country right now. And guess what? Come to the post-capitalism conference and every single one of those non-reformist reforms will be explored. So Jess, I'm gonna turn it to you and ask, uh, is there anything going on in the Q&A format? Cause I don't have access to it or anything else in the chat that you want to particularly lift up? Yeah, I don't have any open questions right now in the Q&A, but just, again, I sent some appreciation. My sister, Ana Rosa Riso Centino is here. I'm really grateful that she joined us for this evening. Yeah, she's like, we all need to get on the solidarity economy train. And I think one thing that I'll just add there, it's like, we can do so much better than the system we currently have in place. When you think of post-capitalism, think what's next, what's better, what's life affirming, what's actually gonna get us to the future that we all deserve. So that's how I like to think about it. Fantastic. And I think uh, Ana Rosa is somebody who I met through Jess and the transition movement. Is that, am I remembering that name, uh, yes, Jessica? Sir. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. nice to see you. Well, I guess I'm not seeing you. It's nice to be in the same digital space with you again, Ana Rosa. Yeah, she's amazing. She's executive director for One Step a la Vez. They do some amazing work on the Central Coast serving the Latinx community and doing some, been doing some amazing work with mutual aid and empowering youth. Yes, much love. All right, thanks for the heart. And so folks, we are gonna wrap it up. So I'm gonna give uh, 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 an opportunity to, eat, to both Jessica and Mike uh, for some final concluding words. Uh, so Mike, I'm gonna turn it to you to, uh, 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 to, to, to share your, your thoughts. Absolutely. And I'm going to do an experiment, right? And, you know, if this experiment goes right, um, then, you know, you will, you will identify with what I just did, right? I am going to recite some affirmation statements about the solidarity economy, you know, at least from my lens and my perspective, and perhaps, you know, you will identify with what you were hearing. In the solidarity economy, we respect resource limits and create resilience. We adopt self-organization and decision-making at the appropriate level, participatory democracy. We are part of an experimental learning network, pluralism. We collaborate and look for synergies. We promote inclusivity and social justice. We pay attention to balance. We freely share ideas and power. We foster positive vision and creativity. 
And for those who of you are familiar with them, I just read off the, the, the principles of transition US. So <laughs> there's already alignment between the values of the solidarity economy and the values of transition. Um, and you know, and 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 if we need to wrestle around this notion of post-capitalism, we certainly can, because there's an argument to be made that you know, um, capitalism can foreclose on a lot of that sort of expansive, experimental visioning and creativity that you know, um, transition U.S. seeks to express in its principles. And so, you know, with that, um, I I will uh, you know um, bid you all th thank you all for for uh, allowing me to join this evening i appreciate you know the conversation and the exchange um and the opportunity to wrestle with these ideas that i'm always still you know juggling within my own head uh and and you know look forward to more of this more of the same at the post-capitalism conference mike strode you are good at this my friend that was well done that was so well done i didn't even know you were doing that to me until you exposed it that was so sweet and so well done just i almost i, I almost feel bad that i'm going to say how are you going to follow that because i can't well I, i'm just gonna i bow to you sir like that was, <laughs> was amazing and i was like listening i'm like is he doing what i think he's doing he's doing it and this is amazing <laughs> so i think again this is an invitation for folks who maybe have had some resistance around this thing to to dig a little deeper look at these resources that we're going to be sending your way and again this is an invitation to think creatively, to follow the energy, to join in solidarity and struggle with others for collective liberation. And it, it's it's going to be a beautiful ride. So join us. Like Ana Rosa said, jump on this train. So get on it. Get on audience. it. Yeah. Yes. And so I'm going to actually now both make myself vulnerable and take a risk and do something that Mike saw our colleague David Ferris do. Uh, uh, who is, uh, again, a board member at the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network and also works at the Highlander Institute and Folk School for Liberation in Tennessee. Hallowed ground, by the way. If you don't know about uh, uh, Highlander, look it up. That's literally where one of the places, one of the places uh, where the U.S. civil rights movement was incubated and strategized. Hallowed ground there. Um, but I'm going to invite Mike uh, and uh, Jess, who are the only ones who can do this that we can see, but I'm literally going to invite you, even in your own home, if you're in a place to be able to do this, I'm going to say three things, and I'm going to ask you to repeat them back to me. It, it won't be much, so Mike and Jess, y'all got to get ready for it. You okay. ready? I love you. I love you. I respect you. I, I respect, respect you. you. I want you to be free. I want you to be free. I want you to be free. There you go, y'all. We can do this together. And here's the kick. We can only do it together. Mm. Peace. Yes. And with that, wow. Thank you all for joining us. This was an amazing conversation. Again, a reminder, we're going to be sending out a recording to everyone who registered and folks who were not able to attend this evening. I think, David, you had committed to, to putting together some notes or some resource. Great. So I'm going to hold you to that. And it's going to be awesome. And again, I've dropped the link a few times in the chat. But here is the link to register for the Post-Capitalism Conference happening April 22nd through the 25th. Hope to see you there. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mike. What an honor to be with you. All right. Can you stay on for just a second, Jess? I know that you're recording. I'll let you stop there. Yeah. Oh, Anna Rosa, it wasn't working for you. Um, hmm. Hmm. So uh, here is my email. Oh. Are we done? Yes.